Good evening. Hi, everybody. I know there are still some people coming in because the traffic's typical Washington, but um, we'll get started because we have an exciting uh, evening ahead of us. Um, my name is Kim Sayet. I'm the director of the National Portrait Gallery, and I do want to welcome you sincerely to the museum and what I know will be a terrific conver uh, conversation, time to coincide with the opening of the exhibition Forces of Nature, Voices That Shaped Environmentalism. The show is on view on the second floor uh, until September the 2nd next year, and it's generously supported by the Honorable Doris Matsui and Roger Sant, who unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight. I very much want to thank the Monterey Bay Aquarium for their collaboration and their support of tonight's program. Specifically, Ken Peterson, the Aquarium's senior content strategist, and Kevin Connor, the director of communications. We first got to work with the Monterey Bay Aquarium about five years ago when we began the process of commissioning the portrait of Julie Packard. As is customary, we asked Julie, what kind of artist would she like to have do her portrait? And she said, well, I want a woman. I want ideally somebody who lives in California and really somebody who can paint fish. <laughs> OK, well, we got two out of the three right when we paired her with Hope Gangloff from New York. I had the pleasure of interviewing them both about that matchmaking process for our ingeniously named Portraits podcast. On the episode, Julie talked about choosing to stand in front of the aquarium's magnificent giant kelp forest, teeming with fish. However, I do have to say that there was a moment of excitement, a frisson, one might say, when Hope learned that she had forgotten to paint in the teeth of the California sheep's head by Julie's elbow. Apparently, a sheep's head without teeth wouldn't survive very long because they subsist on eating crunchy things, so um, I hope you do listen to the episode. It's really a lot of fun. I also want to thank Kaia Black on our team for helping to organize this and our Portrait Circle members who are here tonight. They really are our main group of supporters and we'd love everyone here in the audience to become members. Uh, please see Matt upstairs in the lobby after the program if you'd like to learn a little bit more. And also, you're all welcome after this um, panel conversation to join us for a light reception in the Kogog Courtyard. As we were walking through it this evening, I said to Julie, don't you think this looks like an aquarium? And she's like, oh, kind of. There's no water, but I think, you know, we could pretend that we're in an aquarium kind of a situation under the sea. Anyway, that's after this discussion. The Forces of Nature was curated by Lacey Baradell before she left to become an assistant curator at the US Senate, at which point one of our historians, Mindy Farmer, helped shepherd the project to fruition and work with Emily Kwong, the moderator of tonight's performance, to share information about the sitters on view. Emily is the host of Shortwave, NPR's science pod, uh, podcast, and we're tremendously grateful that NPR is the media sponsor and supporter uh, in, in media for the program tonight, so thank you so much. Lacey Baradell is an art historian whose research interests intersect with history and science. After earning a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, she held various museum positions until 2020, when she worked as a science historian on detail from the National Science Foundation here. It's a position that we'd love to eventually make permanent because most of us, including myself, are humanities scholars and we don't know what we don't know when it comes to science. Thanks to Lacey, Forces of Nature is one of the very few exhibitions that we have done in the past 50 years that talks about this intersection of science and culture and certainly the first that draws a straight line from personal action to environmental impact. Drawn from works in our own collection, we need to be adding more portraits like Julie's to talk more about the issues of pressing concern like species loss and the environmental damage on biodiversity and human health in order to be relevant to contemporary audiences and remind people that they do have the power to change the world. So with that clarion call, I'd like to invite everyone up to the stage and invite Lacey to give a few more remarks so our moderators could come up and our panelists. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that introduction, Kim. And thank you all so much for coming and braving um, what I understand is some formidable traffic outside. It's my great pleasure to be with you here today as the curator of Forces of Nature, Voices That Shaped Environmentalism, I want to touch briefly on a few themes of the exhibition before I introduce the speakers for this evening's presentation. The exhibition presents portraits of US scientists, politicians, activists, and writers who represent various aspects of environmental thought from the early 19th century to the present. One of my goals for the exhibition, which is reflected in the word voices in the exhibition's title, was to understand some of the contours of environmental discourse. The wall texts for every portrait in the exhibition include the sitter's own words. And together, the portraits and the sitter's words raise big questions, like what is our relationship to the natural world? And what are our responsibilities toward it and toward each other? How do scientific, political, social, economic, aesthetic, and moral considerations shape these debates? Visitors to the exhibition will likely find some viewpoints with which they agree, and likely even some with which they strongly disagree. I know I do. But above all, I hoped that the exhibition would spark curiosity, conversation, and engagement. Though the exhibition presents a range of voices, it is far from comprehensive or fully representative. It reflects the historical exclusions of environmentalism in the United States and the traditional modes of portraiture. With this in mind, I hoped that public programming like this evening's discussion could help paint a fuller picture. So I'm especially delighted that such a wonderful panel has been convened, and I want to extend my thanks to all who made this event possible. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers, and I will be going from your left to right. Um, first, we have Dr. Dorcita Taylor, who is an environmental sociologist, professor, and the senior associate dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the Yale School of the Environment. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the National Audubon Society's Women in Conservation Award and the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. Dr. Taylor is an influential scholar whose work addresses topics especially germane to, today, to today's discussion, including her 2016 book, The Rise of the American Conservation Movement, Power, Privilege, and Environmental Protection, and the were award-winning book, The Environment and the People in American Cities, 1600 to 1900s, Disorder, Inequality, and Social Change. Next, we have Dolores Huerta, a labor leader and a civil rights icon. As the founder and president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation, she's been a staunch supporter of social justice and public policy. Known for her grassroots political organizing and environmental, racial, and around environmental, racial, and economic injustices, she co founded the National Farm Workers Association, which later became the United Farm Workers. She has received numerous awards for her advocacy and commitment to equal rights, including the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Julie Packard is a marine biologist and the founding executive director of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. She's led the aquarium to become a global force for ocean conservation through innovative exhibits and education programs and science-based initiatives addressing sustainable seafood, plastic pollution, climate change, and protection of ocean wildlife and ecosystems. A trustee of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, she chairs the board of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, a leader in deep ocean science and technology. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a recipient of the Audubon Medal for Conservation. Our, an, another of our esteemed panelists is Wawa Gatheru, the founder and executive director of Black Girl Environmentalist, a Public Voices Fellow on the Climate Crisis at Yale University, and a recent Revolutionary Power Fellow at the US Department of Energy, where she worked to integrate energy justice into the federal landscape. 
She has become a prominent voice of her generation, using the power of social media to share how communities of color and women have been adversely affected by climate change and to highlight the legacies of those traditionally sidelined from mainstream environmentalism. Harnessing her academic background as a Rhodes Scholar and her work as a youth climate activist, Wawa's goal is to help create a climate movement made in the image of all of us. And our moderator for this evening is Emily Kwong, who is the founding reporter and co-host for Shortwave, NPR's flagship science podcast. Since July, she's been on sabbatical with LAS Studios to develop a new show that explores Asian American Pacific Islander history through family narratives. Kwong got her start as a reporter at KCAW, a community radio station in Sitka, Alaska. Chasing stories onto fishing boats. Yeah, give it up for Sitka, Alaska. <laughs> Chasing stories onto fishing boats and up volcanoes, her work earned multiple awards from the Alaska Press Club. Emily was a longtime co-lead for an employee resource group at NPR and advocates for Pan-Asian and Pacific Islander employees and is also the co-president of the Association for Independence and Radio. And so now I will turn it over to Emily. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Is this working? It's working. OK, great. Well, we're so honored to have you here. Uh, thank you for coming out on a weekday to the National Portrait Gallery to be among, honestly, legends. When I saw the lineup for this panel, my stomach started doing flip-flops and I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I'm gonna be too nervous because really these individuals are, are leaders and you're gonna, you're in for such a treat. And also I don't want you to be intimidated by them either because what we wanna do, what I wanna do up here is get you to shift your thinking about the environmental movement. It is for everyone, for the people, by the people. So that means seeing yourself as someone who could be a part of all of this. Um, and I hope that's what you take away from it, in addition to checking out the exhibit. There is no uh, National Portrait Gallery without the land on which it sits, the ancestral lands of the Nacochtank and the Piscataway peoples. I wanna pay respect to their elders, past and present, and um, kind of dive right in, thinking about elders and generations before us by asking each of our guests, you know, there's so many different people represented in the exhibit, itself. How many of you have seen it? Raise your hands if you've, all right, you saw. There's Henry David Thoreau, there's, you know, John Muir, um, George Washington Carver, there's all these people. Who is an environmentalist who has shaped you? Wawa Gatero. Yeah. yeah. Um, hello, everyone. And hello. Um, I am also very, very nervous. I have quite literally. This is the nervous end of the, <laughs> of the row. The nervous, yeah. <laughs> the nervous end for sure. Um, <laughs> I don't often get to be on the same uh, stage as a lot of icons that I've looked up to in, in this work. So thank you all for the work that you've done and the way that you have influenced the next generation of climate leaders or budding climate leaders. In regards to my favorite environmentalists, um, I have some of them sitting here. Um, but honestly, I, I'd say my favorite environmentalist has to be my mom. Oh. So, <laughs> is she here? And it's, is she here? No, I wish she oh, was. Okay. Um, but it's funny because I don't think my mom would um, call herself an environmentalist. And even in answering this, I don't think I've ever asked her. Huh. But in regards to a figure that has really informed the ways in which I have understood my ancestral relationship with the planet as a Kangan American Kikuyu woman, my mom did that in every which way. My mom immigrated to the US in the late, or no, early 90s. And when she moved, there was this plot of land in her backyard that everyone told her that would never grow anything. Mm -hmm. And she, having grown up on a farm, having come from a family that has long been in relationship with the land as farmers, she took that up and was able to cultivate it into a garden that I grew up spending time in. And just seeing the ways in which she was able to really showcase the love for the planet, love for stewardship, and translate that into the foods that we grew up eating, and the ways in mm. which she taught this ethic of love and reciprocity in the practice and also in the language that she used, really, I think, served as a grounding principle for me to, years later, identify as an environmentalist and join this movement. 
Are you going to tell her that you said this? I am. Good. <laughs> what do you think she'll say in response? She'll probably be like, oh, would you go? <laughs> oh, Julie Packard, who's shaped you? Well, that was so inspiring and um, so different than my answer to the question, which is why we're here tonight. It's so wonderful to, to, to be able to talk about you know, how we came to care about the environment. In my case, I have to say it would be my father, David mm -hmm. Packard, who was um, very much of a generation, uh, as you, you would read in Dr. Taylor's book, if you pick it up, about the history of the conservation movement, um, sort of uh, powerful, mainly white men of a generation that, uh, that wanted to um, spend time in nature, mainly hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. That was his thing, and he and his business partner bought a big cattle ranch, and, and he just loved the outdoors and was an early board member of the California Nature Conservancy and got our family foundation involved in a lot of land protection in California um, in the 60s and, and 70s. And um, over time, uh, as my sisters and I got involved in more environmental advocacy and activism. We didn't always get along so well, I have to say, but um, in any case, he definitely, um, I, I know, it, you know, everyone I think has a story of some connection um, with the value of nature and other living things, and uh, that, that, that was where mine Mine began, I think. Did he, did he take you on hikes? Did he go outside with you? Well, yes, we absolutely spent on hikes, but he had a very utilitarian point of view. You had to be going on a hike to go fishing. We grew up in an orchard. Um, he had a cattle ranch. You had to be driving around looking at the cattle feed, and, and gotcha. it was not just the appreciation of beauty. It was, yeah. let's put it to work, but also appreciate it. Wow, shout people. out to parents. The parent environmentalists among us, all right. Um, Dolores Huerta, hello, how are you tonight? Thank oh, you so I'm much fine. for joining Thank you. us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who has inspired you? Well, I think yeah. my um, earliest, uh, you might say, consciousness of the environment was when I was a Girl Scout, okay? Uh. So I was a Girl Scout from the time I was eight years old till the time I was 18. I kind of grew out of the Girl wow. Scouts. Yeah. Uh, but you know, going camping and then learning all about nature, identifying trees, and um, uh, so much talking about the, the way that we have to care for animals, et cetera. I think that was my first uh, uh, consciousness, you might say, about the environment. Uh, but then, of course, then working with farm workers and seeing the devastating effects of pesticides, for instance, and seeing uh, uh, farm workers that were, uh, you know, getting ill, people that were dying from the misuse of pesticides. It was like a sharp awakening about the fact that we have to do more about the environment. And I have to say, Rachel Carson also, uh, reading her her book, The Silent Spring, and then uh, thinking about the pesticides. And I guess when uh, we knew that DDT, for instance was also hurting animals like eagles in California. Mm -hmm. So many of the eagles were disappearing uh, because of the fact that they would eat rodents that had been affected by pesticides. And, and then also in just doing uh, grassroots community organizing, I've uh, seen so many of our communities of color that were the dumping grounds, you might say, uh, for so, many, uh, so much waste uh, that was happening in our community. Yeah. And seeing that again, com communities of color were adversely affected by so, uh, so much of many of the uh, toxics that are, that are being put on, on, on Mother Earth. Okay? Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it was like a rude awakening. Right. You might say that we have to do something ab about. You took inspiration uh, from your whole life uh -huh, and what you yes. were witnessing yeah. around you. So to speak, yes, definitely. Which I feel like anyone can do. Mm -hmm. Anyone can look around and see mm -hmm. or read the news or learn. Mm -hmm. um, you are such an example of that. Um, yeah. Then, uh, you know, given, given the inspiration that you have to do something about it. Yes, okay? we're going to talk about that. It, okay? <laughs> yeah, um, Dr. Dorsita Taylor, thank you so much for being here. Who has shaped and inspired you? I... Oh, and use the microphone. Yes. Sorry for the Sorry. P pops. Sorry, NPR. I know I should not do those, but yeah. Is that working? Good. Yes. So um, I will do the multicultural route by saying I started in Jamaica, where rural Jamaica as a child, uh, outdoor tasks, I realized that was an escape from the indoor tasks. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, 
our property had about 200 rose bushes. And so I really started honing in on differences in plants and in the roses and really spent a lot of time doing zoology and botany because as a child in the 60s coming the first generation to get into independence from British rule, nobody taught you basketball. Uh, regardless of your color, you, you excel in the sciences, in the classics, in poetry, etc. So I spent an awful lot of time doing zoology and botany and chemistry. It wasn't until I got to the United States that I discovered that as a black person, I was not expected to excel in the sciences, and I certainly wasn't expected to do environment. And one day in our advanced environmental studies course, they showed a film on Rachel Carson, mm. and I was just fixated. Like, here's a woman who was being persecuted, not being offered positions. And Rachel Carson was a zoologist and would have gone to Johns Hopkins to do her PhD in zoology had her mom not taken ill, and she was the, the breadwinner in the family. So I completely started to model myself off of that, that strength that I saw in her when everybody told her that pesticides, there was, she was wrong with that, she held her ground. And as I often say to my students, no, don't be stupid. If, if somebody tells you if you go and lie in the road, a car will run over you and kill you, get out of the road. But if you have an idea that you are convinced is a good idea and you can prove it and you can work at it, and if no one else sees it, don't back off. And so I really got to admire Carson that way. And as you, many of you know, Carson had cancer, and that was actually part of what killed her eventually. When I had cancer, I was writing uh, the environment and the people in American cities, all 762 pages of it. Mm -hmm. And I would take those people, took chemo buddies into the cancer ward, right, to get their eight-hour infusion. I would take the manuscript in, because I was finishing up the manuscript, mm -hmm. and I'd say to the nurses, what's in... What's in the injections that you give us before the infusion? Oh, it's just to make you sleepy. I'm like, hold that. Mm. Because I had the manuscript spread yeah. out all over me, right. <laughs> all around me. Everybody else really thought I was crazy. But I was like, Carson had cancer. Right. She was not getting anything to make her sleepy. Uh -huh. And if she could do it, as yeah. she was writing Silent Spring, I can do it. Wow, you were in communion totally with her. do it. Yeah, and she's on your necklace you showed me. Yes. She has, you have a necklace with her face on it. Yes. Yeah. You can see it later on. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, don't be intimidated. They're all very nice people. You should ask your questions. Um, Dr. Taylor, I'm going to stay with you um, with this question. So, oh, and by the way, we have open Q&A starting at 645. So think about what you might want to ask. This exhibit traces the history, as Lacey was saying, of environmental discourse. It's not meant to be comprehensive. It's like voices, voices, voices. These are some of the major tensions and themes, and it's like this bob and weave between all these scientists and activists and writers and critics. There's some pro-fossil fuel people in the exhibit, you'll see. Um, and, you know, there, the panel at the front says there's many contributions, including those of indigenous communities and grassroots communities that are not represented. And I think it's easy when you go to an exhibit as to somehow see it as comprehensive and defining, like, oh, everyone's here. But actually, it's, it's true to think about who's not here when it comes to this exhibit and the gaps in the exhibit. And so I'm wondering, and you wrote an entire book about this in writing about conservation history. So um, three books. <laughs> If you could tell us a little bit about, yeah, who's, hmm. if you could tell us a little bit about the environmental movement in terms of the history of exclusion right. and who is missing in this exhibit. So if we just, if we think of the exhibit and think of it as a form of storytelling, as a form of uh, trying to look at some of this. And I'd like to thank the people who put this together because this is historic in terms of even having something like this focused on environment. But as I went through, Sakawajia is someone I would think of putting there. 
And you can remember she, as I often say, without her, Lewis and Clark would not have made it too far outside of St. Louis. Because they, um, and she was a child bride. And one, some of the ways in which when I do environmental work, I don't just say Sacagawea. She was 14 years old. And with that baby on her back, and everything now that we understand about women and miscarriages, people do believe she would have been pregnant while she was on that trip a second time, but might have miscarried. Uh, it's written up as kind of a malady. But women are now going back into the historical um, records and looking at some of this to say, exactly what are we talking about? Uh, York, the slave. So the black male who goes uh, to the West, again, Lewis and Clark would never have made it to the Pacific without York. Uh, when they come back East, the only two people that did not get massive amount of land or payment for the Lewis and Clark expedition is York and Sacagawea. So I would have, uh, it would have been, uh, if, again, because this is portraiture, but if we're looking at who might be important people, those two. Another slave, Phyllis Wheatley, uh, in the exhibit, you, I don't think we have Ralph Waldo Emerson in it, do we? Yeah, so Ralph Waldo Emerson is really one of the early writers and thinkers, but I'm not gonna um, lament his uh, absence. Uh, the person who we'll talk about is uh, Phyllis Wheatley. She was a slave in Boston, and now as we go back into people's writing, we're seeing that she was really the first person in America to start to write about environmentalism uh, with this romantic kind of undertone that we see in it, but in this positive light. She influenced Emerson, so Emerson knows of her because Emerson is a Bostonian of elite, um, upbringing and um, would have been very familiar with her um, slave master. And she influenced Thoreau. And when you look at their writing, their writing borrows strongly from Wheatley. Wheatley was taught to read and write. She was brought into the US as a seven-year-old child. When the auction was held in Boston, she was the, the little girl that was left standing on the slave deck because nobody wanted a kid and this family brought her in. She learned to read and write and she excelled in poetry. She's one of America's earliest and first poets, but we need to read her as an environmentalist when you read her work. Uh, another slave woman, I'm full of them tonight, Harriet Tubman. Uh, Harriet Tubman, and if you read The Rise of the American Conservation Movement, I put a fair bit of uh, emphasis on Tubman because as I've often said to my students, if you are enslaved and you want to get to your freedom and you have no GPS, no fancy cell phone, and most of you can't read a map, um, uh, could you get out of slavery and could you do it in the night without all the markers, with dogs tracking you? Here is a slave woman that had the highest bounty ever on the head of any slave in the country. She goes back in and out of slavery 29 times, frees over 300 people. We celebrate John Muir for all his walks and trips and stuff to the south. Tubman put more miles in because not only did she do it repeatedly, she had to go to Canada when, um, when, the, when the slave laws got tight. Mm -hmm. uh, other women that was interesting that we could think of are people like Mabel Osgood Wright mm -hmm. and all the women who were founders of the National Audubon Society. After yeah. it was founded, then um, got shut down. And all of those women. Good. Another interesting person would be W.E.B. Du Bois. And I would put him in, if you think of environment, not just as the beautiful thing that we look at, uh, but as urban. W.D.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to get a PhD from Harvard, uh, goes to Philadelphia and does one of the most amazing studies in, in Philadelphia around the condition of housing, um, diseases, waterborne illnesses in, uh, in uh, that city and focuses on the African-American population. 
Jane Addams from Hull House. We know her. Mm -hmm. But Addams and Du Bois were among the group of multiracial um, activists that founded the NAACP. Uh, but Hull House looked at, oh, again, worker rights, worker justice, the, um, the dangers that workers were facing in those factories and the slaughterhouses in Chicago. And then I'd get to Carson, which I think is, I think, the second woman yeah. in the exhibit. So quite a number of people, if we kind of think about their roles, that as we expand an exhibit like this, expansion, <laughs> and we keep an exhibit like this, permanence, um, we can include and evolve uh, all of this. Wow, that was a history lecture. That was, okay. Thank you so much. I, it's true, the museum, you know, we, we toured the exhibit earlier and learned that there's 26,000 portraits at this museum. There's a few, there's several redundancies, but of those, 75% are men. And then of the, the STEM portraits among scientists, 88% are white men. So there's an enor enormous effort by the museum to diversify its collection, and you'll see the exhibit is working within its historical limitations, but I think it's really important to talk about why those Im limitations exist and to do better. Um, I was very pleased to see um, Dolores Huerta as a voice, vo vo forces of nature? Voices of nature, a force of nature in the exhibit. You <laughs> are a civil rights icon, and you were someone who actually you know, you didn't grow up with a farming background. You came upon the issue yourself. And I was wondering if you could dial back the clock of how you came to care about this issue as a person who wouldn't naturally have become necessarily an environmentalist. Well, I remember um, I grew up in San Joaquin County of California. Uh, we have a delta there. Uh, it's a beautiful environment. But I uh, moved to Delano, California when we started the farm worker movement. And one day I was out there and I see what look, uh, on a hot summer day, I see what looked like a bank of fog rolling in. I say, well, how can you have fog on a hot summer day? And you see this, this white cloud. And then I found out that that was actually a pesticide that was rolling in. Uh, later on, uh, you know, we got these issues about the farm workers that, that were be becoming sick. Uh, we did a door-to-door -door survey oh, before that. Uh, we were working on getting rid of DDT. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went to testify uh, here in Washington, and uh, there was a senator, Senator M Murphy. He had been a tap dancer way back when. I'm talking about back in the <laughs> 60s, okay? <laughs> anyway, so I was testifying in front of that committee about the fact that DDT uh, was harmful to the environment and har harmful, to farm or harmful to everybody because it stays in your body, right? And he threatened to have me arrested. He said I was lying and if I, I did not stop talking about DDT that I would be arrested. Well, I kept on testifying and I didn't get arrested, okay? I stayed there. So uh, then, uh, you know, going on uh, thinking about uh, what was happening to the farm workers, then we did, uh, decided that we had to do something to get rid of all of the pesticides because there, there's not that just DDT, malathion, parathion, uh, many uh, fungicides that they use. So we made a, a decision in the Farmers Union to go after all these pesticides as many as we could uh, to get rid of them. We call many of them the dirty dozen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we had to prove that, uh, that these uh, uh, these economic poisons, because that's the, the legal name, were actually hurting the farm workers and the environment. So we went door to door uh, in a couple of towns, there were about four different towns in the San Joaquin Valley, and found that the uh, cancer rate among children was over almost 1,200 times higher than normal. Mm. So we said this has to come from pesticides. So we tried to get uh, different governmental groups to go in there, and they did go in there. They, you know. They verified what we had found out by going door to door and talking to farm worker families. And we actually made a video about this. And there was one farm worker child that was born without arms or legs. And uh, we kind of used that, that family. And then, so we had probably about a dozen families. Well, then they were approached 
uh, by some of the powers that be and were told not to tell their stories. And some of them backed out. But this one particular family, the Franco family, they said, no, we could use their story. Uh, so we made a video about this and we went uh, you know, across the United States showing this video that this is what pesticides do to children. Mm -hmm. Well, so they sent uh, people down there from the government to study what was going on. And they did decide, yeah, yeah, it is the pesticides that are causing these horrible deformities of these children. And then they, but, the, but then they said, since we can't really know which pesticide it was, mm -hmm. there's nothing that we can do about it, okay? And the whole thing is that uh, people don't realize, and I have to say because of our, of, you know, our five-year strike and our two-year boycott that we did on grapes, and I'm sure probably some of you in here never ate any grapes. Thank you very did much. Did any of you not eat grapes between 1965 and 1970? <laughs> okay, yes. She organized that grape strike, <laughs> which was the first time farm workers were really able to get these contracts. Uh, so uh, thanks to all of you that did that, then uh, you know we were finally able to get a, a little bit of, just, of justice for farm workers, and that we were able to get some of those pesticides actually banned. Then one could say, great, you know, that we finally got rid of these pesticides. But no, because they keep coming up with new ones, okay? And and it's not only the farm workers. People don't realize, or, or I'm sure a lot of you do know this, that we have the highest cancer rate in the world in the United States of America. And a lot of this is from the poisons that, put on, that are put on our food. And I don't think that there's gonna be a solution uh, to this problem until we can put all of the uh, issue of economic poisons, uh, put it under health and human services, take it out of agriculture, uh, take it out of the EPA, otherwise I, th I think it's going to continue, you mm -hmm. know, because they keep coming up with new poisons uh, to put on our food. And uh, you know, my own mother died of cancer uh, because uh, we had a hotel, and my mother used a lot of the pesticides in the hotel in the hotel there, you know, to, uh, to to make it to make it safe for the people that lived there, not knowing that the poisons that she was using uh, for any kind of critters out there were actually, uh, you know, causing her causing her death in the future. And then going on from the issue of pesticides. Oh, by the way, I do have to mention this when we talk about our heroes that you mentioned is that uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, you know, he did uh, for a 36-day fast. He went without eating any food, just water and Holy Communion mm -hmm. uh, for 36 days. And the reason he did that fast, he wanted to bring to the attention uh, of the American public the dangers of the pesticides that are used on our food, you know? Yeah. And so, and I think he did, he did get that message across. It probably cost him uh, his early death uh, Caesar died at 66 years old. Yep. His, both of his parents, uh, his father lived to be 101, and his mother lived to be 99 years old. And we do think that that may have uh, been part of his con. The other thing about that Caesar did, before he started, uh, he wanted to prove to the world that you can grow food without pesticides. So Caesar planted a garden, okay? He planted a garden uh, without using any pesticides at all, you know, using different herbs and flowers and, and, and different, uh, uh, you know, herbs to keep away the, the pests, you know, so that they wouldn't eat the food. And the food was so amazing, okay? Yeah. I had forgot what a carrot tasted like. <laughs> it, it was, it was I, so good. I mean, so listening good. to you spell it out, it just is so clear how much physical sacrifice it took for environmental justice to exist. I mean, you were not arrested that time, but you were arrested multiple times throughout your career and the sacrifices of life. I mean, it's not a given, basically, that environmental justice is even something we could be talking about in regards to environmentalism. So I really thank you for that. You oh, know? oh, you're welcome, but uh, it was well worth it. <laughs> well. <laughs> we know that we have to uh, keep uh, working on this, and I think the good news is that there are some uh, agricultural employers now in California they're, uh, that actually are or organic farmers, okay? Organic farmers. And you know- That deserves uh, an applause, yeah. 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 <laughs> organic yeah. farmers. Yeah, and, and that was to say that uh, when it comes to agriculture and farming, you know, that we also have to talk about water. I guess we can talk about why, water yeah, later why don't on. Yeah, I want to leave time to, yeah, to get definitely. to Julie. Speaking of water, you are a marine biologist. Uh, you've dedicated your entire career to conserving the oceans, and you've kind of 
been in DC for the last week doing a lot of ocean-related advocacy work. There are so many areas of the climate movement that require environmental justice. And you know what I mean, we, I think you gather what we mean by that, right? It's like a climate future that's like just for everyone, not just some, that the people who are bearing the brunt of climate change are not the people who caused it, really making that the center of the movement. Um, what does that look like in ocean science for you? Just to focus on one specific area. Happy to do that, but I'm still digesting these amazing remarks from Dolores, <laughs> sorry. But then growing up in California, um, just have to thank you so much for your work, but also, you know, so many of those issues still happening. We are so not done. And, um, and I got involved in working on the ocean. Honestly, I don't even know how I was studying botany. And then I took some, some marine algae classes and fell in love with the ocean. And then my older sister and her colleagues came up with the idea to, to, to build the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And we all worked on that through our family foundation. And mm. you know, originally, the idea was just to be a place for people to learn, so, you know, science education, public awareness. But over time, we realized that you know things were not going well in the ocean. I mean, you looked at the California coast; it's such a rich and diverse habitat. And we used to use the, use the word pristine, and of course now we know there's no place in the ocean that's truly pristine. Um, I mean, there's microplastics everywhere to the to truly. the deepest depths, we're and, swimming and in them. obviously overfishing and. Mm -hmm you know, ocean warming, losing kelp for us, so many changes happening. But, um, but I decided that instead of, you know, just being a place of awareness and inspiration, which certainly is, is an aquarium's best, best opportunity, because no one has a chance to get under the ocean surface to, to connect. And when we were talking about how we got a connection with nature, well, believe me, like no one has a connection with what's under the ocean, unless you happen to you know, be in a coastal nation and you're in the water all the time. So we decided that we needed to really parlay the education into into the take action piece. And yeah. so yes, I am. We we have a wonderful policy and advocacy team at the aquarium and just spent the last few days. Um, and you know, of course, when it comes to the future of the ocean, uh, it's really about the future of humanity because, I mean, the ocean systems, I mean, it's not only about food security, the ocean is such a huge driver of global climate. It's really, obviously, it's what, what enables life to exist it's here. It's like where 50% of our oxygen comes from. It's produced oxygen, it's absorbed 90%. Absorbs of, all this carbon. 90% of the heat generated mm -hmm. since the Industrial Revolution, you know, a huge yeah. amount of carbon. Um, and yet, you know, it requires a living, healthy ocean to do that, I would say, you know, like a dead ocean isn't going to do any of those things for us, never mind that that would be mm -hmm. a very tragic thing. But um, so... So what does it but, look like to bring justice to so ocean to, to bring to bring justice to, to the ocean um, and, and ocean and climate um, movement is so much of the environmental advocacy, of course, it has been driven by you know, mainly white male legislators and mainly uh, environmental organizations that are not led by um, by people of of color. But I think there is a growing um, a growing awareness of incorporating the voices of those most affected. And you know, privileged white people, these things can happen in your in your community. But generally, you're not the place where the flood happens or where the toxic river is coming by and polluting your water. And so I think there is a growing, a growing um, awareness and, and, and effort happening in that direction, which is really good. There's also a growing um, movement toward focusing on more livable cities and more green space and more, um, you know, as far as climate goes and warming in all of these cities, mm -hmm. um, you know, making livable places as, as, as the, the climate heats. And in terms of ocean solutions, um, they're, it, it's very interesting that because the ocean, because no one owns the ocean, the solutions often involve um, global impacts. And for example, a big impact that a lot of the ocean advocates have been working on is this matter of plastic waste and plastic pollution in the ocean. And there's a global treaty now um, that's 
been proposed with a very short timeline, and actually the um, meeting is happening in Nairobi right now um, with a goal to have have something to produce um, yeah. very soon. Do you and, think there are the right voices at the table and, to really and, represent that? Yes. Well, not surprisingly, when you look internationally, the U.S. we are not a leader in those meetings by any by any means when it comes to plast oh, plastics. Oh boy. Plastics are made what a from, shocker. Plastics are made from fossil fuels. We are the biggest producer of plastic mm -hmm. in the world. And um, yes, there's not a lot of motivation to uh, to change here, but um, those those kind of resource extraction and resource impact uh, questions that we need to get a handle on, uh, It's we just need to get the voices around the table. And I guess I would, would um, maybe end with saying, uh, we also did a congressional briefing about seabed mining, which yesterday, which for those of you who haven't heard about this dreaded topic, um, it's not a good thing, but it's about uh, mining, mining rare earth minerals and other minerals from the seabed um, for our use. And of course, a lot of those minerals are used in things we love, like our phones and our computers. Mm -hmm. But it would and mean like digging up the ocean floor you're and pulling the all the stuff floor. out. Yeah. You're scraping the ocean floor. Mm -hmm. You're sucking up a huge amount of sediment. You're spewing it into the water column, um, pretty much killing anything living there that, uh, that, that um, you know, filter feeds, right. et cetera. In any case, not a good thing. And one of the speakers we had was a Hawaiian elder who told this um, very moving story just about, um, about how in the origin story, the creation story, in his culture, um, life began in the deep sea. I know often scientists say, oh yes, life began in the ocean. I mean, I suppose, yes, the first, the first microbial life. His, his, his story was how um, the deep sea is where life began, and as in, in many indigenous cultures, all living things are, are part of us. And so, you know, yeah. when you kill a living thing, you're killing your ancestors. And, and that kind of thinking um, is something very alien to, um, to the sort of industrialized And I believe he's known as Uncle culture. Saul, Uncle yes, Solomon, yes. And, this um, individual. Yeah, yeah, and he... Um, uh, He's been a Hawaiian commissioner yeah. and, and all of that. So thinking about, you know, indigenous voices, certainly thinking about those that are most affected, such as in the state of California, which produces a huge amount of the food for our nation. Mm -hmm. and, and we really have such a long way to go, even a progressive state like that, yeah. okay. in terms of, um, of environmental you know, quality of life yeah. and toxins um, and, and the ocean. It's course, almost like related. what you're saying is <clears throat> that uh, just as we're thinking about who's not in the exhibit, um, for reasons we understand, we need to be thinking about who's not a part of the movement constantly, constantly, and, and who's being most impacted by that. And I feel like um, I, I put you in this order on purpose <laughs> because your work is all about bringing the movement to everyone and creating, uh, supporting a generation of in unlikely environmentalists. What does that look like to you in your dream world where anyone can be an environmentalist? Yeah, I love that what question. What is that vision? Ooh, I love that question. Um, I think also I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge, and I'm sorry I didn't do this before, but when I talked about my mom, um, when I think about the genealogy that has allowed for me to be who I am and to be in the space that I am, it has all been built by black and brown matriarchs from across the diaspora that have known for so long what it means to fight for a tomorrow even when it wasn't certain. Mm -hmm. And so we actually go back, I talked about how I never asked my mom if she was an environmentalist. I didn't identify as an environmentalist until I was 19. I joined the movement when I was 15. I turned 25 last Monday. Happy birthday. So 10 years <laughs> in the climate space, which clearly isn't a lot <laughs> of time. But um, you know, I, it, it took me four years in the movement of being, at the time, a youth climate activist, even though I, I guess I still am, if the youth term still resonates, yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and, and, You're like, you I'm know, not a youth anymore. I, sometimes I don't I can know. drop the youth. Um, <laughs> but one of the reasons why that term didn't resonate is because the, like, the idea of 
an environmentalist was not one that I felt like included me, did not feel like included my community, my community as being a black American as well as being a Kenyan woman. And in regards to being a young person, I remember going into my first movement space in Hartford and being the youngest person by 30 years, the only person of color, and having a lot of people be like, we've never had someone like you come in. And I was like, well, here I am. <laughs> and I, I experienced a lot of that, a lot of surprise on why I'd be interested in joining the climate movement, why I felt as though the truth of the fact that the climate crisis is the biggest existential crisis of all time. And even Dr. Taylor, hearing your story of you know, similar parallels there, even decades later, I think that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done, especially for youth of color to really see themselves represented in this movement. And I think a lot of the language that we have to use is really understand that there has been this mainstream environmental and conservation and climate movement, but there has always been people a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I found that in rediscovering a lot of the folks that I grew up learning about, whether it's Phyllis Wheatley and you know reading a hymn to evening and realizing that that was an expression of an environmental, it was an environmental expression. It was right. a poem that was depicting a very, unique relationship with the planet from a black woman's experience and understanding Harriet Tubman as a figure that was a you know disabled black naturalist and understanding that legacy and I think that oftentimes what we need as a generation is that language of connecting the intergenerational pieces a big example that I think about is you know Fridays for Future 2018 this massive international attention to young people's participation in this movement and it was interesting because I had been in the movement for a couple years at that point and was really really excited about this but the more research that I did the more that I realized that it was actually not the first time that young people had walked out of their classrooms before. 55 oh, really? years before, um, May 3rd, 1963, black children huh. walked out of their classrooms. What? Yes, the Children's uh, Crusade. Wow. Um, and they came together at Sixth Street Baptist huh. Church and essentially participated in a nonviolent march that essentially led to and contributed to the passage of the, yeah, yeah, a lot of people this don't. This is another history. I, a lot of people don't know so this, yeah. but just 55 years prior to the 2018 mm -hmm. Fridays for Future March, and mm -hmm. I think when, when it comes to being a young person and being saddled with the biggest crisis of all time, it can feel really overwhelming. Yeah. It feels like a lot. It feels like we don't have the capacity and resources to be able to shoulder this. And I think a lot of perspectives are needed to really, to do that. A is understanding that we're not alone. Mm -hmm. It's a weight that we're all meant to bear together. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, even though we didn't contribute to the problem, we have yeah. to solve it together. But two, we're not reinventing the wheel. Like I said before, people have had to fight for their lives before. There's so many communities that have experienced um, a tomorrow not being possible in the same ways that other communities have. And I think that when we lean into that, when we see, for example, the civil rights movement as being tied to the environmental justice movement, as being tied to the mainstream climate movement, it allows us to realize that the moment that we young people find ourselves in is actually a part of this intergenerational and generational inheritance that we're meant to be social change makers. Young people have always led social movements mm. and we are just taking the reins in this very unique way. That's an amazing perspective shift. I mean, really, because you're saying this is not a new thing. And in fact, you can go back even further perhaps hundreds of years of youth who were fighting for this, whose names we'll never know, who will never get portraits of themselves, but nonetheless, we're, we're standing up for the same thing. Yeah. We wanna take your questions. Um, we might have time for two or three. There are microphones somewhere, or, oh, or, or I can give my microphone over. There are microphones at the back. Kaia, thank you so much. Kaia Black, thank you, you're the best. From the museum, yes, yes, yes. Um, say your name and who you wanna direct your question to. And it could be to everyone. Okay. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Alexa White. Um, I first wanted to say hi to Dr. Dorsita Taylor. Um, I used to uh, be her student uh, at the University of Michigan. I'm a PhD student there right now, about to finish. Um, but I really wanted to reflect on the historical context that you were talking about today. Um, oftentimes in my research, I'm always thinking about my own identity and connection to chattel slavery and um, the African diaspora and uh, how internationally um, environmental justice is uh, being uh, expressed in taking hold and I really wanted to know what is the connection that you that you think Dr. Taylor between uh, chattel slavery um, and the history of the environmental justice movement at an international scale it it definitely goes back uh, all when you look at many countries within the US outside the US it is a very big part of it as I mentioned again someone like Sakawajia Here's a little 14-year-old girl, and uh, her husband is a bigamist because he left one wife on the reservation, takes this 14-year-old child uh, on that Lewis and Clark expedition, and we celebrate the manhood of it all, but we're missing that piece of, uh, of what was going on there. On the slave ships coming from Africa, there were a lot of children. Phyllis Wheatley was just one of them lots of children, and those children, uh, when we look at, um, at conservation and this notion of womanhood, uh, one of the things I question and talk about in my work is we're really talking about white womanhood. And we're talking about white women um, in terms of gaining this, this sense of being able to hike and go into outdoors. Nobody saw young black girls young Native American girls as, um, as girlish to be left in the house, to be sent off to schools. They were put in the fields to work at the same level that the men were put in the field. So if we go to Harriet Tubman, she wasn't very good at housekeeping um, at all. She would break every dish in the house. So the quote unquote mistress of the house puts her out in the, in the fields. And she was put out in the field to work alongside her father for the same length of time. Seven, eight-year-old girl, um, lumbering, uh, doing the hard work in the field, hard labor, as the men were doing. And we see it all the way through American history where children, children in slavery, we see it today if we look at farm working communities. We, or if we look at communities in which children are not pay, or where families are not paid enough a living wage, then they, children are often co-opted and put into the workforce to make enough money just for, uh, for, for families to, to earn a living wage. And so until we start to look at youth and how youth are, um, are unpaid work in a lot of places, then we're really not gonna get at environment very much. If we go to like Jane Addams and part of what Hull House was doing out in Chicago was to basically look at the, um, the factories and they were the ones that really pushed the idea of children should be in school and linking the school day and mandatory public school education for children to get the kids out of the factory. And uh, so we, we definitely have to pay a lot of attention that it's still going on today, both in the US, but in other countries of the world where there are just thousands, if not millions upon millions of children that are still you know, in those factories. The, the factories around um, clothing and um, and, uh, and looking at those spaces, definitely paying a lot of attention to that. But it's something that's been through conservation. If the conservation movement, well, they had a lot of blind sides. But if you remember at the point of which the conservation movement was really taking off, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, something like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. That was going on, lots of child labor in that. Uh, we had elite environmentalists saving birds, yeah. wildlife, elephants, everything. And we're doing it now. The polar bear, 
you know, nobody's talking about the, the native children, the native families that are also, their, their villages are also being inundated. Mm -hmm. Every picture is about that white polar bear on the white ice, <laughs> and none of the brown faces are in those pictures. Dolores Huerta just raised her eyebrows. <laughs> Thank you so much, that was a great question. Yes, just say your name and Oh, okay, sorry. Two. Um, well, first, really quickly, um, who on the panel is doctor? I just want to make sure I uh, announce you correctly. Besides um, uh, doc I Dr. Taylor? Dr. Taylor. That's it? Okay. Um, I definitely don't have a doctorate degree. Okay, so. just making sure. Yeah. Um, greetings. My name is Adrian Wilson. I'm Thank a recent you. graduate of Florida A&M University. And my question is directed towards my first, well, this is a, a two-part kind of First question is directed towards Dr. Taylor and then Ms. Gathero, and then second part is directed towards um, Ms. Packard. And also, thank you so much, Ms. Huerta, for all of the work that you've done. It truly changed my life in understanding how I want to work with food. Um, but first, how does the environmental sector, and even just as um, an entity itself, try and how is it trying to change its you know, especially with institutions and organizations, how are they trying to get that better sense of getting more black and brown students into environmentalism? Because I didn't realize that I wanted to study environmental science until my third year undergrad. And it was like a big change for me and it's something that I'm really passionate about. And then following into second from Ms. Packard, talking about how, um, I think his name was Big Solomon is what you said. Um, how is the relationship between you know, Western scientists and native people and also just like indigenous groups changing because a lot of people don't see them as scientists where they are actually scientists because they're the mm. people who have been the original, you know, the original people on the land. So yeah. those are just my two questions. Great, Wawa, do you wanna start with that? Part one. Thank you so much for your question. Um, this is a lot of the work that I do with Black Girl Environmentalists. So Black Girl Environmentalist is um, the nonprofit that I founded in 2021, and we're working to resource and support early career black women and black gender expansive folks in the climate sector. We have three impact areas, and one of them is green workforce development. And just a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, we actually had co-hosted a BIPOC green career Summit um, in DC with Green Jobs Board and Black Oak Collective, which are other two incredible organizations with similar missions. We had over 100 young people, early career folks coming together to um, gain skills around how they can enter into and thrive in the green economy. I think something that a lot of people are seeing now, especially as, as young people, I'll, I'll speak for myself, my entryway into climate was not at all a fascination or something that I was like inherently interested in. It came out of a fear. I was learning, I knew that the climate crisis was around. I watched An Inconvenient Truth when I was five years old. My first grade art teacher played it for us. Very formative well, film. Very, yeah. I think that was my awakening too. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, and you know, my parents were like, okay, what are they playing you <laughs> at school? Um, but I, you know, I, I, I I really, at 15, decided I want to dedicate my life to environmental justice and climate solutions, whatever that was. I didn't know what it was, and I'm still figuring it out, because I realized that the climate crisis was not just impacting marginalized communities around the world, first and worst, but I realized that it was black communities in particular that were experiencing amongst the brunt of the crisis while simultaneously not being in places of leadership or acknowledged leadership in which our expertise as frontline communities has not historically been understood and properly resourced. And so right now there's this moment where we're seeing like millions and billions of dollars of investment going into the green economy, but the question then arises, if our movement still struggles with diversity, if we know with the you know, Green Report 2.0, which I believe Dr. Taylor, you're one of the folks that made that happen. The only person who wrote it. The only person that wrote it. I mean, it doesn't get better than this. Um, A lot of people have taken credit for my work. <laughs> You know, in regards Let that not <laughs> happen here. Correct the record. You know, Dr. Taylor's work of, of showcasing that we folks of color, even though we make up almost 40% of the US population, don't exceed what 12 to 16% representation in this movement. And then all this money is coming around and it's like, okay, so who is 
going to be getting this type of investment. Yeah. And so I think that there's a number of factors that are happening. And I know, Dr. Taylor, you talk about this so much. And I'm like such a student of your work. Like, let me just say that. Probably the most cited person I've ever, like in my whole academic career. Actually, yes, the most cited person. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of assumptions, I think, from institutions, academic institutions. At my first environmental job at my, first, like my University of Connecticut, my undergrad, I was told that black people don't care about the environment. When I asked about oh. the lack of black and brown students in the environmental spaces on campus to my face as a freshman, um, I think that that also informs like outreach that's being done. I think people, for lack of a better word, half-ass it because they think we don't care, even though we do care. And there's so much polling that showcases that folks of color, I believe Latin communities are the most concerned about the climate crisis than any other group, for yeah. example. Um, there is a lot of those misconceptions that exist. But then also there's misconceptions that we have around, OK, I want to have a career that makes money, right? I want to be able to have an impact, but you know, I might come from a family where I have to send money home. I need to be someone that people can rely on. Can I enter into a career mm -hmm. that has historically not necessarily been one that provides early folks you know, funding? So I think all this conversation needs to come to a point of doing better work at reaching young people early, like in high school, um, Gen Alpha, for example, right now, like the 13-year-olds and younger, they need to be getting the resources to get the access, not only into the outdoors, but understanding that green jobs can be anything. A green job in a climate future is any job that just you know, has parameters around sustainability, around climate metrics, as well as making sure that um, we're properly resourced. I think that something that we really, really need in this movement is more funding directly going to black and brown leaders that know what it means to actually create pipelines and access for folks to be retained in this space. This movement has a pathway issue, but it has a retention issue as well. When people come, they leave. I have almost left so many times, and it's been honestly women of color who are more senior in their career that have quite literally picked me up and gone, Wawa, we need you. We need the next generation of youth of color. So we need those folks to be more resourced. And we're kind of seeing that right now with a lot of this investment going to a lot of EJ leaders that have for so long been doing this work and are you know getting their flowers now. Um, they need to be resourced, but also this next generation a lot of people don't know, but August is Black Philanthropy Month, and I learned that black nonprofits, over 80% of black nonprofits receive less than $50,000 a year annually. Mm. Wow. That is insane. So when we talk about putting money where our mouths are and yeah. really supporting frontline communities, we need to be doing that, and I think it directly goes into like yeah. the pathways for young people. Dolores, yeah. do you want to say something? I, I, I want to make a comment. Uh, in terms of money that is coming into communities, in terms of doing the environmental, environmental work. Uh, I live in Bakersfield, California, uh, which is an oil producing place. And uh, we know that uh, President Biden, as uh, part of Build Back Better Act, that they have a, a funding that is going to different communities to try to do the transition uh, from fossil fuels to green energy. But guess what's happening? The oil companies, okay, uh, because, uh, Baseball, California produces about 60% of the oil uh, for California. Uh, the oil companies have already positioned themselves to be able to get the money, okay? And they are coming up with some of the uh, projects that uh, we, we don't think as environmentalists that are really going to work. You know? And, and they're, they're actually advertising this and they're talking about carbon sequestration and they want to put it in cylinders and they're gonna to try to keep the carbon in there and then they're gonna put it into the ground and then it can escape from the ground and yeah. it can be, become deadly methane. <laughs> Maddening. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we are, you know, we are trying to figure out how can we stop this. Right. And uh, some of our friends in the EPA say uh, there's no way to stop it. And of course, there's got to be some way to stop it. So uh, uh, I get to call it greenwashing, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of greenwashing. That some of the polluters and, and the people that are putting all of their dark oil money into politics and into 
and environmental issues that I think is a, something that we all have to really be concerned about yeah. and to figure out how we're going to be able to stop it. And I guess probably one of the ways that we have to try to stop this from happening is through our political arms that we do in terms of voting and uh, getting people that are elected that are going to be true environmentalists. And so I think that's got to be a concern that all of us have to worry about all of the work that we're trying to do to save the planet. And we have people that don't care about the planet because all they care about is how much money they can make. Mm -hmm. Julie, do you want to take the second half of that question? Yes. And I think we might have to end it here, which this panel is like bursting at the seams beyond its one hour container. I knew this would be kind of impossible. So both of you who still have a question, when this is over, just like come straight up to the front and ask your questions directly. Um, and thank you all for being such a great audience. Do you want to yes. answer that question about traditional ecological knowledge? And Yes, we'll do. But first, I can't resist making a little follow-on to yeah. um, well, well, your amazing um, statement about you know needing to provide more opportunities for leaders coming up to provide a, a point of optimism there, which is mm. this is something that institutions like the Monterey Bay Aquarium and, and all the informal science education institutions have such a great opportunity. I mean, we've had two million students come through you know, our place. And, and mo many of these institutions, they are really focused on, you know, raising up uh, leaders of color and providing, you know, paid internships because students cannot afford to be volunteering if they, you know, need to work in the summer and and and. There's really a lot of, I think, a lot of exciting focus on that, and that's none too soon. That is for sure, um, because. And it's not just the educational opportunities; it's 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 the retention. I mean, that's and and it all goes together. And and um, so, to the point of incorporating um, traditional ways of knowledge, that that is so not part of any of our education in in America. I mean, we all weren't we weren't educated about any of that way of thinking, it's totally the antithesis of anything you learn in science. And I think it's really just baby steps right now of really, I wouldn't say the science community and the science academic environment is doing anything to uh, open up about those points of view. I think that uh, many of the conservation advocacy organizations um, that are you know, looking at solutions that involve more voices uh, and, and realizing you need to have the voices around the table and the stakeholders and the solutions um, and not just be, you know, looking, looking to the science. I mean, I think there are, um, there's part of positive movement there, but it's pretty slow. And it's really when legislation is happening, say, as we're creating a new marine protected area or we're talking about seabed mining, you know, I think there is more movement in our definition of stakeholders now, which is to include you know, tribes. Bring the people that yeah. are, that you know have been here before any of us, you know, mm -hmm. here in the U.S. to you know talk about not only their solutions and their ways of being and ways of thinking about their relationships, and and I mean they've been living in obviously in in a way a much less ex resource extractive way on the land for you know, for millennia, and, um, but it, it, it's a slow go, but it's starting to happen. I yeah. guess that's how I, would, how I would say it. When I lived in Sitka, we would say, uh, the Tlingit would say, since time immemorial. And I love that phrase because a museum is constrained by time, but humanity goes so far back. And I just really thank you all for bringing so many voices into this space just by saying their names, and then by sharing your stories, too, with all of us. It's been a total, total honor. Um, please give a huge round of applause for these panelists. Oh, wow, yeah. There is a reception in the Kogod courtyard. Is that how you say it? Kogod? Kogod, it's the one that looks like a fish tank. Someone said it looked like a fish tank. So go there. Those two folks who didn't get to ask their questions, please come right up to the front and have a wonderful night. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, could, could we end with a chant? A chat? Could we end with a chant? A chant. So can I do a chant? Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay, okay let's ask everybody to stand up. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah.
Uh, and, and I'm going to I'm going to end that ch the chat with the words in Spanish. Si se puede, which means yes we can, or means yes I can, or which President Obama used, okay, uh, to win his campaign. And when I met President Obama, he said I stole your slogan, and I told him, <laughs> yeah, and I told him yes you did. So it means yes. We can. So it means yes I can and yes we can. And I think because the environmental issue is such a, uh, it, you know, we're talking about life on our planet, right? and life in the future. So uh, I think uh, every one of us know that we have to do something uh, in our own lives, you know, to be able to stop global warming, to support those people, all of the environmentalists here uh, that are making a difference, okay? So I'm gonna ask all of you two questions, and I know you know the answers, but wait for me. So the first question I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you who's got the power, and I want you to say we've got the power. And then I'm gonna say what kind of power? I want you to say people power, okay? And but I want you to shout it really loud uh, so all the haters can hear us. <laughs> you, you know who they are, right? So all, all of those that are, are working against all us, okay? The haters out there. All the haters out there, okay? So, but I want you to shout it really, really loud uh, to make sure because, and it's also, again, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting our commitment out there that each one of us is going to do whatever we can uh, to make sure that we share the knowledge that we learned here today and do whatever we can to save our planet, okay? Uh, are you ready? Okay, okay, let's go. Don't forget, who's got the power, okay? Who's got the power? We have the power! What kind of power? People power! Are, are all of us going to be working together in an individual way to do whatever we can to make sure that we stop global warming and we save our environment? So let's all do it together with an organized hand clap, and we're going to say, si sí, se puede, can you do that? Si se puede. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.